The B-25 was one of the most popular Allied bombers in World War II. Originally designated the NA-40, the prototype built by North American Aviation first flew in January 1939. It was designed as a medium bomber, but would evolve into much more. A gunship and low altitude tactical attack bomber. It was rugged and powerful. It was also heavily armed. Its tricycle landing gear was an innovation. So popular was the B-25 that it was the only American aircraft type flown by the Army, Air Force, the Navy, and the Marine Corps. The B-25 was also a popular export, flown by the RAF and other Allied Air Forces. Nearly 10,000 were ultimately built during the war. Variants continued flying operationally well into the 1970s. The Mitchell was appropriately named after U.S. General Billy Mitchell, an outspoken early advocate of aerial bombing. Mitchell had incurred the wrath of his superiors demonstrating the effectiveness of air power after World War I. It would not be until the 1930s that his vision was recognized. The American Army Air Corps was quickly built up as the Second World War approached. Young officers eagerly joined up, but they needed modern machines to fly. The Mitchell was popular from the start. It needed relatively few revisions after initial testing. As a medium bomber, it originally was configured with three 30 caliber machine guns forward with a single 50 caliber in the tail. It was designed to carry five men and up to 3,000 pounds of bombs. Its flight ceiling was nearly 24,000 feet, but usually attacked from lower altitudes. Its operational maximum speed was 240 miles per hour. It was powered by two 1,700 horsepower Wright R2600 Cyclone 14-cylinder radial engines. Early RAF experience with the Mitchells pointed out the need for heavy armaments and 50 caliber gun turrets were added. America was still at peace, and these modifications were approached at a leisurely pace. That would soon change. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, changed the world. America had been caught unprepared, these attacks came when there were few Army Air Corps bombers in the Pacific capable of hurting the aggressive Japanese. Many of the planes that were deployed were destroyed in the Japanese raids against Hawaii and the Philippines. The Americans would strike back. The American plan to launch 16 B-25s off the carrier Hornet was unprecedented. Conventional carrier planes didn't have the range or capacity for a large-scale raid. Only the Mitchell was sturdy and powerful enough to take off in less than 500 feet. The crews trained in secret, with only the high command knowing their real destination. Markings were placed on the runways to delineate the length of a carrier flight deck. All extra weight was stripped from the planes. Even some guns would have to go to make room for the extra fuel tanks and the additional weight of gasoline. Tactics were practiced. The bombing run would be low level at about 1,500 feet. The bombers had just enough range to hit Japan and then fly on to land in China. Doolittle planned to launch once the Hornet was 450 miles off Japan. But the ship detected a Japanese picket boat when the American fleet was still some 800 miles from Japan. Doolittle made the brave decision to attack, even from this great distance. But it would be a one-way trip for the flyers. 
After dropping their bombs, they would barely be able to reach the Chinese coast. The weather was miserable. A 40-knot gale blew, but it probably helped the planes get airborne. General Doolittle personally led in the first plane. Just after noon on April 18, 1942, American bombs rained down on the Japanese capital. The enemy was caught off guard. Anti-aircraft fire was ineffective. The greatest enemy was the shortage of fuel. Most of the planes made it to China, but just barely. 49 out of 50 men parachuted to safety. Two planes crash-landed by Allied lines, but two planes ended up in Japanese territory, and some crew members were executed by the Japanese. One plane made it to the Soviet Far East, where aircraft and crew were interred by the then-neutral Russians. Relatively little damage was done during the raid, but the psychological impact was great. Up to this point, the Japanese had seemed unstoppable. Now the war would take a different direction. American morale soared, but the Japanese were angry. They would send their fleet to Midway to destroy the Americans in one final great sea battle. But it would be the Japanese fleet that was devastated. The Japanese aggression in the Pacific had finally been halted. The war was far from being won, but the Americans had shown with their B-25s that they had both the courage and the technology to bring the war to the Japanese homeland. General Hap Arnold, head of the newly designated Army Air Force, adopted the Mitchell as his personal staff plane early in the war. The very attributes that made it a favorite with pilots, speed, maneuverability, and ease of handling, made it a perfect staff plane. Still, the B-25 was a warbird, and tests continued on fine-tuning its design. After the first prototype had flown and required modifications made, the B-25 went into full production. The first B-25 design flew in 1940, and production models were delivered to operational squadrons in 1941. Improvements and refinements were an ongoing part of its manufacture. Pilot armor was introduced, along with self-sealing fuel tanks. The North American Aviation Plant in Inglewood, California was a prime manufacturing point for the B-25. North American designed the plane to be built with 48 major assemblies. This made modifications easier. It proved to be a major advantage of the B-25. The A, B, then C series were soon pouring off the assembly lines. Later models of the plane were also built in Kansas City, Kansas. Every revision was a potential major improvement. The lower gun turret, for instance, was dropped. New ways of positioning guns were devised. Again, because of the North American aviation approach to construction, making individual assembly units, these improvements could be ready-made. In the B-25 H and J models, countersunk rivets were used to reduce drag on the forward third of the fuselage, with brazier heated rivets used in the rest of the plane. This pushed up both the speed and the ceiling of the Mitchell. The gun design included both manual and mechanically controlled fire. The B-25 became part of the home front offensive in America.
Aside from the drama of the Doolittle raid, the B-25 was, in the beginning, simply a medium bomber. In the Middle East, it acted out this classic role. It served alongside heavy bombers, such as the B-17 and B-24, in strategic, precision, high-altitude raids. As such, it was more vulnerable to German anti-aircraft guns. Mitchell supported the British 8th Army's great offensive at El Alamein. They struck at German troop concentrations, gun positions, and vehicles. The struggle in the Middle East proved to be a painful introduction to war for many American air crews. North American aviation engineering proved itself in the field. Support crews were easily able to cannibalize parts from damaged aircraft to piece together new aircraft. More than one B-25 flew that had begun life as two or even three airplanes. In many ways, the B-25's greatest success came in the Pacific theater of operations. It was from Australian bases that ground crews began experimenting with the armaments aboard the bomber. The missions over the Pacific were somewhat different than those in the Middle East. Here, Japanese shipping was a main target. Also, the terrain was often dense jungle. The bombers were needed for close air support of ground troops or tactical interdiction missions against small and sometimes mobile Japanese targets. At the midpoint of the war, the threat by enemy aircraft was less than in the European theater. Instead of a bombardier sitting in the nose of the plane, 50 caliber machine guns were installed. This later became a factory standard for some models of the bomber. It really became an attack aircraft. If the forward turret were fixed in the forward position, then 14 50 caliber guns could be brought to bear on a target. Eventually, even a 75 millimeter cannon was installed. One later model B-25 managed to sink a Japanese destroyer after firing just seven shells from this fearsome armament. Further modifications included a maritime version that carried a torpedo. Both the size and weight of the torpedo meant that only one could be carried and not completely inside the bomb bay. Since the Mitchell was not pressurized, the open bomb bay did not hinder its flying, but it would have taken a toll on the crew being directly exposed to the sub-zero temperatures of high altitude. This modification did not catch on as an efficient use of the Mitchell and a more conventional approach to anti-ship armament, such as rockets and regular bombs, were adopted. <laughs> 
through various adaptations, the bomber gradually was able to increase its bomb load from six to eight 250 pound bombs. Changes also allowed for six 325 pound bombs to be carried. External bomb racks were added so that eight 250 pound bombs could be carried externally. All of this provided great flexibility in planning missions for the B-25. In the Pacific theater, change was often quick and the B-25 was a very useful resource. But it was its guns that ultimately proved to be the bomber's greatest asset in the Pacific. For the Marines on the ground, a B-25 loaded with thousands of rounds of 50 caliber machine gun bullets to blast away at entrenched Japanese positions was very welcome. Guns were placed in the nose, alongside the fuselage, and on the forward turret. By late 1943, large B-25 missions were underway in the Pacific. On one raid, 70 Mitchells and B-24 bombers dropped more than 200 tons of bombs. The Mitchell had now been adopted by the Royal New Zealand and Australian Air Forces and the Chinese Air Force. They would be used against strategic targets as well as in strafing runs. Its role as an anti-ship weapon increased. At one point, they were even used against Japanese tanks. In Burma, Mitchell specialized in attacking and destroying bridges. All through the Pacific, thousands of B-25s were deployed, serving from the mountains of Southeast Asia to small islands. At times, the Mitchells were pressed into service as transports, carrying ammunition. They were fast and well able to defend themselves. They could fly out of airfields shorter than those needed by the larger B-17s, B-24s, and the new B-29s. Flying at low levels to attack the Japanese had its risks. Small arms fire could be directed at them, and their own bombs going off could potentially knock them from the sky. Parachute bombs were employed. This would allow the Mitchell to fly at very low altitude and have enough time to escape before the bombs exploded. 
another innovation was the bouncing bomb, which would literally hit the ground, bounce back up into the sky before falling back down and then exploding. It was an unorthodox tactic, but it worked. It was another example of wartime ingenuity. Working closely with the ground forces meant the Mitchells could literally open up pathways for the Marines to advance. Many Japanese airfields were destroyed by air, thus saving countless Allied lives. As the Japanese troops withdrew, the Mitchells could jump ahead of the Marines to soften up targets. This successful close cooperation between ground and air units would lead to aircraft being designed specifically for close air support. While production of the B-25 wound down at the end of the war, its usefulness certainly did not. Unlike many of its sister bombers, such as the B-17 and B-24, the Mitchell continued in service. Some 1,000 Mitchells were upgraded and modified in the 1950s. This included improved engine systems and overall engineering improvements. The American Air Force used the Mitchell as training and staff transport. The last B-25 was retired in 1960. Mitchells were also used by Canada after the war. The Netherlands East Indies Air Force used them against insurgents in the late 1940s, and various Central and South American countries received the planes. The Mitchell, rushed into wartime service, proved a durable aircraft. General Billy Mitchell would have been proud.